Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives, the only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening, and now, enjoy the show. G. Marshall. From 1861 to 1865, the people of the United States were engaged in a murderous civil war. Those years of conflict were the most costly epoch in all American history, not only in money and in hundreds of thousands of wasted lives, but in the complete breakdown of our society. It became, in many places, what was called a war between brothers, especially in some of the border states where the sympathies of the citizens were sharply divided between the causes of the North and those of the South. And death was a constant companion to them all. Tomorrow morning, sir, when my neck is snapped by the tightened rope and I hang dangling in the air, I will still be alive, in pain, but alive. And once I'm finally what you call dead... All it will mean is an end to that pain. Your conclusion? Why go to the trouble of causing me pain one moment, only to end it bountifully the next? It seems hardly worth the trouble. Our mystery drama, A Matter of Conscience, is chiefly based on the Ambrose Bierce classic short story, Parker Addison, Philosopher. It was especially adapted for the Mystery Theater by Arnold Moss and stars Christopher Tabori. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and ARM, Allergy Relief Medicine. I'll be back shortly with Act One. It was early in the autumn of 1861. The American Civil War was only a few months old. To most Americans, the idea of hunting down and killing their own countrymen was still an unusually disturbing experience and a little unreal. The thought that the enemy they were shooting at and who was shooting at them was not from another part of the world speaking a strange and alien tongue but another American still took getting used to. But it wasn't long before that changed. Whatever compassion there might have been began to give way to the cold, unrelenting hatred of the enemy. They tie Say, huh? Say, tell! Ready? Aim! Fire! Corporal, have your men pick up the body of the prisoner, convey it to the place which has been designated, assign four men to dig the grave, then bury the body immediately. By order of the commanding general. Would you care for another egg, Parker? No, thank you, Mother. You've hardly touched your breakfast, son. Not very hungry. Oh, Mother, you must stop fretting about me. Remember, I'm, I'm a big boy now. You're the only son I have. You was your father, going off to the war. You're the only man left in this big house. That won't be for long, Mother. What are you saying? I can't stay out of the war much longer. Parker, you're so young. But I need you, Parker. I need you desperately. So before you decide to do anything right... I'm going to have to leave you, Mother. I, too, am going off to war. Parker, no. I've already signed up. When do you go? This morning. This morning? The Union regiments that arrived last night have taken the town. The southern troops were badly beaten. They're in retreat. I know that. But just the same, I wish I had waited. But obviously there's nothing I could have done to stop you. 
Thank you, Mother. I, your father, all the rest of the boys in gray will be very proud of you. And I'm sure Lorinda will be the most proud. I'm not so sure. Have you told her your decision? Not yet, Mother. I wanted you to know first. Well, she has a right to know. Lorinda's going to be your wife. Mother, it's quite possible you all may not be so proud of me. Why do you say that? My deepest convictions, what I believe about this war, are not, I fear, exactly the same as yours and father's, or even Lorinda's. We all have a right to our opinions. That's what we've always tried to teach you. And if your philosophy differs a little from ours... My well... philosophy differs more than a little, Mother. I've signed up with the Union Army. I'm a sergeant in the Army of the North. I waited for my mother to burst into a flood of uncontrollable tears. Instead, her jaws hardened into two iron bands... Her eyes became burning coals of fire. After a silence, I thought would never end. She finally spoke. Parker Anderson, am I to believe what you have just told me? That you have joined the enemy? I've been struggling with my conscience for weeks. My sympathies, Mother, are with the North. Then we'll just have to get along without you. Parker... You are a traitor to your country and a traitor to your loved ones. You must do what you conceive to be your duty. But your father and I taught you. It's been our way of living, always. But I never for a moment dream... I'm not ashamed of my decision. Don't try to make me, please. I understand. Now, I would be most grateful if you would leave this house at once. Wish me well, Mother. I can't do that, Parker. Not to the enemy of my country. Not to a stranger. My mother's words lashed across my face like the sting of a whip. I knew it was utterly useless to try to justify in her eyes what I was about to do. Within an hour... I was standing at attention before Colonel Herman Braille of the 4th Indiana Infantry. Mr. Addison? A correction, sir. With your permission, Sergeant Addison. I beg your pardon. You signed up with us yesterday, did you not? Yes, sir, I did. I understand you're a local boy. You live right here in this town. And that, that's correct, Colonel Braille. And still you wish to fight on the side of the Union. On our side what might be called the side of the enemy. Yes, sir. Why? Call it a matter of conscience, Colonel. I have searched and examined the issues of this war carefully and most seriously. My sympathies are completely and unwaveringly with the side of the North. To the point where, if it were necessary, you are prepared to give your life for our side? A correction, Colonel. My side... Yes, Colonel. I have a fairly well-developed sense of duty. Only fairly well-developed, Sergeant Edison? Well, you might call it slightly above average. At ease, Sergeant. Now, please be seated. Now, that chair over there. Thank you, sir. Now, Sergeant Edison, a couple of questions. Yes, sir. Have you any thoughts on how you might be of the greatest service to the Union cause to the Army of the United States, and more specifically, to this regiment? I leave that decision to my superior officers, sir. I'm aware of that. Without intending to sound boastful, I can say that I'm a first-rate shot around rifles since I was eight years old. By his name. And for whatever it may be worth, I've had as much schooling as any boy my age. Very good. I've been riding since I was five. I know horses. Excellent. And you surely know this part of the country fairly well, would you say? <laughs> much, much above average, I would say. There's hardly a foot of ground within 30, 40 miles of here I wouldn't recognize as well as I would my own face. 
And then I think my question has probably been answered. Now you might be of greatest use to this army. Sergeant Addison, we need certain information very badly and in a hurry. By sometime late tomorrow night, the hour is not yet set, we pursue our attack on the enemy with everything we've got. I follow you, sir. We give him no relief. However, after yesterday's battle, we're not sure how many of his troops he may be able to regroup or what fresh forces he may have in reserve. He may be preparing to counterattack in strength. I understand, sir. At the moment, we're not sure exactly who would be attacking, what specific regiments, their number, their disposition, their morale. We have only an approximation of all this intelligence. We must fill in the blanks as fully and as quickly as possible before we dare move. Yes, sir. Sergeant Addison, do you think that you could get this information for us? I could try, Colonel. I would do my best. I would not order you to do this, understand. Should you refuse or hesitate, I would not hold it against you. I volunteer, sir, to try to get the intelligence you require. Spoken like a brave soldier. We will provide you with a Confederate uniform, rank of sergeant, I believe. You'll be supplied with false identity papers, a name other than your own. You represent yourself as having been separated from your own company and regiment in the confusion of yesterday's battle. Uh, maybe even that you were wounded. Yes, wounded. Good idea. Then what, sir? You will slip unnoticed, we hope, beyond the enemy lines under cover of darkness. Tonight. Once you have penetrated those lines, we'll give you 12 hours to gather your information and make a safe return. And should I not return within 12 hours? We'll assume that you're in fairly serious trouble, Parker. If you should be so unfortunate as to be discovered to be taken prisoner as a spy, the only questions you're required to answer under the Articles of War are... Name, rank, army identification number. Nothing else. Oh, one more thing. If you're taken, there's nothing we can do to help you. We won't even acknowledge you. You're as good as dead. Johnny Reb, uh, with no disrespect to your former friends and countrymen, is especially sensitive to being spied on. You're right about that, sir. Particularly by a man they would regard as a turncoat. The lowest, vilest kind of traitor. Hardly worth the rope by which they'd hang him to the nearest tree. I'm not unfamiliar, Colonel Braille, either with the concept or that behavior. I promise to do my best to avoid such an uncomfortable and embarrassing end. One slip and you're finished. Remember that. Here are your false papers. They were all prepared. I knew I could depend on you. Thank you, sir. I salute you for your courage. Ah, uh, let's see now. Who are you? Oh, yes, yes. Sergeant Shelby Worth of the 7th South Carolina. Well, I sure do appreciate them kind words, sir. Now, be careful, Parker. The next time we meet, I do not wish to see you hanging from the limb of a sycamore, a rebel rope around your neck. That would not be very amusing. No, sir. Death is not usually very amusing. Finally... I want you to know that we trust you, all of us, with our lives, completely and implicitly, as if you'd been one of us from the very start. Above all, we respect you. I'm extremely touched. Thank you, sir. Good luck, my boy. Lieutenant Howard... Come in, Lieutenant. The man who just left this room is Sergeant Parker Addison. You're to watch him like a hawk every minute that he's here. He is to suspect nothing. I don't trust him any further than I can throw him. <laughs> A man 
man who can turn his back on his friends, his family, and his country is a man with whom we may have small sympathy. At the same time, he is a man whose deep moral convictions many of us are compelled in some strange way to admire. This is the course young Parker Addison has chosen. Where will his courageous choice take him? Directly to Act Two. As night began to fall, Parker Addison, in the uniform of a Confederate sergeant, slipped unnoticed through the southern lines. There was enough of the lingering daylight for him to see that the fighting of the previous night had been hard and murderous. The taste and smell of battle were still in the air. Among the splintered trees lay wrecks of men and horses. Stretcher bearers hurried about, carrying away the few who showed some signs of life. The dead were piled up like so much cordwood, while trenches were being dug to receive them. I raised my hand to my head. It was crudely bandaged to give the appearance of a serious wound. I limped slightly, as, as though I had taken a shot of grape in the leg. Before long, I joined an endless moving line of suffering men, their faces drawn, their ragged uniforms spattered with crimson. A grizzled old soldier hobbled up to me. It, it were a pretty good fight last night, weren't it? Yes, Yes, it was. Never seed our boys put up such a fine scrap. Never. Oh, that they did. Even if we did take some of the licking. Well, we can't win them all, old man, can we? Well, ain't that the truth? Well, where were you hit? A piece of shrapnel caught me here. Right, right here, over my right eye. Did it give you much pain? Enough. Hoping I don't lose my eye. Oh, then, then I caught a little grape here, here in my leg. How about you? Why, well, I took a big one here in the groin. Blood just keeps a pouring down into my boot. Where are you from, Sergeant? South Carolina. Got separated from my regiment. You? you? Kentucky, 7th, Company C. You uh, lads hurt bad? Uh, bad enough. If one out of ten of us is still a living, we'll be doing pretty good. One out of ten? How about the others, uh, I mean, the other companies? Well, from what I hear, we're, we're not in very good shape. Not, not good at all. Why do you think you boys be now? We couldn't say. I mean, did you have any cavalry support or artillery? Oh, we did, but, uh... Well, who is your commanding general? Well, our commanding general? Now, you just wait one solitary minute, mister. You're asking a lot of questions. Questions that ain't really none of your dang business, so it would appear. Oh, I, I, I didn't know what. To... What makes you so dang nosy, anyway? Soldier, you're absolutely right. It is none of my business. Why, well, I, I was just hoping that things were not quite as bad for all of us as the same. Well, I can understand that. You know, a couple of weeks back, young fella come along out of nowhere, just popped up, started his smelling and his sneaking his way around our company, poking a lot of questions at us. What happened? We poked one too many. Turned out to be a dang Yankee spy. But, uh, <laughs> we took good care of him, we did. You did? Oh, you should have seen him flapping around in the wind strung up on the branch of an old oak tree. <laughs> Funny sight you ever did see. Any idea where this column we're in is headed? This uh, column of the walking dead. <laughs> Word was passed along that there'd be some kind of field hospital somewhere up ahead. A couple of miles more, maybe. Oh, I, I see. Yeah, the army surgeons will do their best to patch us up and put put some of us together again in good enough shape to get us back to fighting. That is, if we live long enough to get to ever see them surgeons. We kept limping along in the black night, the whole long struggling line of us. Suddenly, down near Whitewater Creek, we blundered onto a hastily thrown together field hospital. By the light of their crude lamps, the doctors were busy sweating over the wounded men, 
three or four soldiers, rifles at the ready, stood about as guards before I could get out of sight. One of the officers spoke to me. Uh, you're next, Sergeant. Thank you, sir. Now, what seems to be your trouble? Now, if you, if you don't mind, sir, I'd just as soon you took care of my old friend here. Oh, I think he's in much worse shape than I am. Now, you sat down on this log... Now, bring the light a little closer. No, no, pl please, please take care of the old fella. I can wait. He's been hitting the groin, and, and he tells me that... I will make the diagnosis, Sergeant. Now, sit down. Now, first, let's get these filthy rags off your head and see what you've been hitting how, just how badly. Why, well, it really isn't all that bad. When you stop being a hero, Sergeant, now we got all the heroes we need piled up out there like so many fallen logs. Now, you just sit still. The, the wound... It doesn't trouble me all that much. Now, look, Sergeant. Some of these men are on the brink of death. Now, if your wound doesn't trouble you all that much, now, please tell me what in heaven's good name you're doing here. Now, why aren't you with your regiment, Sergeant? Uh, uh... Worth, sir. Shelby Worth. You see, I just got separated in the last night's little fracas. Oh, uh, how? Well, I can't really say... One minute I was with my boys, and the next, I just wasn't. Mm-hmm. I see. And just hold still while I snip these stinking rags off your head. And I, I really would rather you did. You do Sergeant, you let me see your papers. I don't believe I can do that, sir. Just as I became separated from my company, well, somehow, <laughs> in a way I can't explain, my, my papers got separated from me. Who are you, Sergeant? Who are you? I just told you. I, I was hit by shrapnel on last night's... Sergeant sleep. Worth, or whoever you are, you weren't hit by anything. There isn't so much as a scratch any place on your head. Now, you stay where you are. Where do you think you're going? I'm getting out of here, but fast. You hold on there. Sentry! After that man, the one who's running. Over there! Shoot! Take care! The velvety darkness of the night saved me. That and the fact I knew exactly where I was. Like a rat scurrying around in a trap, frantically sniffing out the one opening that would mean freedom. I began to run in the direction of my home. My pounding heart ready to burst inside of me. When my feet would carry me no more, I dropped, exhausted and lost consciousness. Parker? Parker? Are you all right? Uh, where, 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 am, where am I? Who is that? It's me, Lorinda. Lorinda? I had... Oh, what on earth are you doing here? I had a feeling, I can't explain it, that you might be in trouble, serious trouble. I came to look for you, my darling. I don't know. I don't understand how you found me. Well, anyway, one thing, sir. you got to get out of here. I'm going to stay with you, Parker. No, 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 that's crazy. You can't. We're right in the middle of the fiercest fighting of the war. You must stop talking. You must rest. And then you've got to come back with me. I can't do that, Lorinda. We're at war. I I'm a soldier. I can see that. Your uniform. No, no, you, you don't understand. This is not my uniform. Not yours? How can that be? I can't talk about it now. We're in the gravest danger here. You've got to leave, Lorinda. Not without you. I won't. Parker, I love you. I'm going to be your wife. I know, my darling. And I love you, but... Oh, but please, please go back home. I'll take good care of myself, I promise. I'd be much happier if you came with me. You'd be safer. Parker, come with me. And rest, rest, rest. Come with me. You're under arrest. Come with me. Who are you? Who? Where'd you come from? That's the man, Captain. The one who ran away while I was examining him. Thank you, Doctor. Where's Lorinda? Who? Lorinda. The girl I'm going to marry. I don't know what you're talking about. You fell, hit your head on this rock, and passed out. Passed out? 
And now, Sergeant, or uh, whatever you are, on your feet. Keep moving straight ahead. And remember, the shooting end of this rifle is sticking right into the small of your back. A while later, I was led into a wall tent about eight by ten feet, lighted by a single tallow candle stuck into the haft of a bayonet. An old rag carpet covered the earthen floor. A tattered leather trunk, a chair, and a roll of blankets were all else that the tent contained. At the further end, a silver-haired general sat at a pine table, busily writing. The captain who had arrested me was posted at the opening of the tent. Rain was drumming down on the canvas. I <clears throat> beg your pardon, sir. Hmm? I believe, General, you... You want to see me? Oh, yes, 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 of course. So I do. Prisoner, I... Oh, no. We'll follow the rules of war. State your name. Since I'm to lose that at daybreak tomorrow morning, along with everything else, I, too, will follow the rules of war. The name, sir, is Parker Addison. You're right. A somewhat humble one. You see, commissioned officers are considered much too precious to be risked in the perilous business of spying. I'm a sergeant. A sergeant? A lowly sergeant. I did have hopes of promotion had I been fortunate enough to succeed in my mission. What regiment? I'm afraid I can't answer that. Why not? Besides being a somewhat improper question, begging your pardon, sir, improper from the point of view of the Articles of War... My answer would give you a good idea of whose forces you were facing. And? I came into your line, sir, to obtain such information, not to give it. You admit, then, that you are a spy for the Union Army? <laughs> it would be useless as well as untrue to deny it. That you came into my camp disguised as you are in the uniform of a Confederate soldier. True. Would the general permit me to ask a somewhat personal and perhaps irrelevant question? Well, what's that? I noticed that there's a large nail driven into the tent. There, where, where, where the captain is standing on guard. Yes. From it is suspended a sword belt supporting a long saber, a pistol in its holster, and, if you'll permit me to say so, absurdly enough, a large, long-bladed, double-edged bowie knife. Well, what of it? A most unmilitary weapon, wouldn't you say? Perhaps a souvenir of my days as a civilian, when I would go hunting in the company of my son. I... I once had a son. I'm sorry, sir. Thank you. Any more questions? No, sir. And thank you. Captain? Yes, sir. Please take this paper to the adjutant general immediately and then come back at once. Yes, sir. And, uh, the prisoner, general? I'll take care of the prisoner. Just do what you're told. Yes, sir. Sergeant Addison? Yes, sir. It's a bad night, isn't it? It certainly is. For me. I can only hope that things will be clear by morning. For both of us. In times of war, an ordinarily gentle person, in almost no time at all, will often be transformed into a hardened, impenitent mechanism who can sleep soundly on a hill that trembles with the thunder of great guns, play cards among the dead faces of his closest friends, or, without blinking an eye, calmly and coldly assign another man to... to what? I shall be back shortly with Act Three. A stormy night in the autumn of 1861, somewhere in the south. One of the earliest battles of the Civil War has just been fought. The driving rain cascades in torrents upon the canvas of the Confederate general's tent. 
the elderly officer sits at his rough pine table. He has just given a folded paper to a sentry with the order that it be delivered immediately to the adjutant general. The general's young prisoner, a spy for the North, stands before him at attention. You are aware that what you have done is a capital offense, the punishment for which is death? I am, sir. Can you guess what was written on the paper I just handed the sentry? I'm usually not very good at guessing, sir. It may be my immodesty, even my vanity. But I venture to suppose that I was mentioned in it. Your assumption is quite correct. The memorandum to the adjutant general is in order to be read to the troops. It concerns... My execution. Correct, sir. It also contained notes for the guidance of the provost marshal in arranging some of the details of that rather special event. Special, sir. Well, it's not every day that a northern spy falls into our hands, particularly a northern spy who was born and raised right here in the south. I hope, General, that the provost marshal will arrange the spectacle with taste and with intelligence. I'm sure he will. Uh, one question. All you like, sir. Have you any arrangements of your own that you might like to have carried out? Any messages to your friends, your family, your loved ones? Do you wish to see a chaplain? A chaplain? At daybreak? <laughs> At five in the morning? No, I couldn't think of being so inconsiderate of another man's sleep. Well, besides... I could hardly expect to secure a longer, more pleasant rest in heaven by depriving a chaplain of his rest. Do you mean to go on to your death with nothing but these silly jokes on your lips? One hardly jokes about death. I would have no way of knowing about that, sir. You see, I've never been dead before. This is all very new to me. Now you will not be serious. Isn't there anything more important you could say... At a time like this? Isn't there anything more important you can say to me, sir? I know that death is supposed to be serious. Something one should not treat lightly. But I've never heard this from any of those who have actually experienced it. I see no point in discussing this any further. One thing I'm sure of. Of all the dead men with whom you, in your soldierly occupation, have strewn your path... I'm sure that few have shown any noticeable signs of either pain, suffering, or regret. To me, the very thought of death is horrible. Yes, yes, I, I have seen men die. And I admit I've been the cause of many of those deaths. To see a young life snuffed out as you would blow out the flame of a candle... Then why do you add me to your long list... Meaning? You could order your men to release me. Under the circumstances, such procedure might be considered understandable, if not reasonable. One last point. Yes? Suppose I made an attempt to escape. Here, this very minute. Well, you wouldn't dare. But if I did, what would you do? No, 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 don't tell me. You would lift the revolver you are courteously concealing in your lap. You are aware of that? You would fire. My stomach would be filled with several ounces of lead. After perhaps half an hour of pain and agony, the last pain I should ever know, then I should be what you call dead. So what is the point you're trying to make? Tomorrow morning when I am hanged, when my neck is snapped by the tightened rope and I hang dangling in the air, still alive, in pain, but alive, I'll be looking forward to the moment of my actual death. But it will mean that my pain has ended. Death is very kind about such things. You, uh, you think so? That's why I ask. Why? Why go to the trouble of causing me pain one moment only to end it bountifully the next? It follows that it would hardly be worthwhile to hang me at all. What do you think, sir? That death is terrible. And you can go on talking from now until... 
until you're made to stop. When you die, your death will be the most terrible of all. To you, and as you must realize, to me. There was a long silence. The storm had ended. The general sat there impassive, as if his eyes were mountain guard over me, while his mind concerned itself with other matters. Finally, he drew a long breath, shuddered, as if he had wakened from a dreadful dream. And, as though talking to himself, kept repeating... Death is terrible. This man of death. Death is terrible. General, you sent for me? Huh? Who's that? Uh, Captain Hesterlick, your provo marshal. Of course. Come in, please. Thanks, sir. I got your message from the adjutant general. Yes, of course. Captain Hesterlick, this is the Yankee spy who was captured inside our lines in a Confederate uniform. He has confessed. Yes, sir. I believe the storm has passed. Yes, sir, it has. It's clear night. Moon shining. Good. As I wrote the adjutant general, you're to take a file of men, conduct the prisoner to a firing squad, and have him shot. Shot? Yes, sir. At once. No, you can't mean what you're saying. No, no, I'm not to die until morning. I never said a word about your dying in the morning. Of course you did. No, it was you who had been speaking in terms of tomorrow morning at daybreak, not I. That was an assumption of your own. You die tonight. But, but why? Why are you doing this? General, I'm to hang. I'm not to be shot. Well, it'll take at least two hours to erect a gallows. You wouldn't hang me from a tree, would you? And certainly not shoot me. What difference does it make? Spies are hanged, not shot. I have my rights. Rights under military law. Captain Hasterlick, proceed with your orders. Yes, sir. Prisoner, face the opening of the tent. The point of my saber is quite sharp. Now forward, toward the tent opening. <laughs> It was three short steps to the tent pole. I sprang toward it like a cat. I seized the handle of the long bluey knife that was hanging there. I thrust the captain aside, leaped upon the general, and with the fury of a madman, hurled him to the ground. The table was overturned, and the candle was extinguished. Help me, Captain! Help me! The provost marshal pounced on me. In no time, the three of us, a welter of limbs and bodies, fought and clawed at one another in the pitch black dark. Get that knife away from my throat. I heard the tent collapsed upon the three of us, and beneath its heavy folds, the struggle went on. The captain, on guard outside the tent, had obviously fired his rifle to attract attention. Soon the drums began to beat the long roll. Bugles sounded the assembly. Swarms of half-clothed men, dressed as they ran, rushed into the moonlight, fell into line. When all was under control, the men stood at arms, while an officer and the men of his escort tried to bring order out of the chaos I had created. Someone lifted the canvas of the tent that had covered the three of us. You! Our prisoner! Yes. Stand up, if you can. What happened? I... Well, I, I, I can't... I can't say, sir. Captain Tasman? Dr. Tasman? Uh, Captain has to look dead. That bowie knife, the general's bowie knife, is stuck deep into his throat. And clenched in his hand, his own saber, streaked with blood up to the hill. You, how'd this happen? I, 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 don't, I don't know. Look to the general. Okay, now, now, you're hurt here. Let us help you. I know. I, I think I... I... <sighs> He's taken at least two sword thrusts. Now, one in the thigh and the other in the shoulder. He's lost a great deal of blood. Do what you can. I was dazed and shivering. It was as though a heavy white fog had settled on everything about me. I could not raise my right arm. It was broken. I shrank from whatever help was offered me. Cowering on the ground, babbling a torrent of words... Words I could not understand myself. My face, swollen by blows and stained with blood, 
felt as though it were a ghastly white. The whiteness of a corpse. I heard a voice say, No, no, he's not insane. He's merely suffering from fright. Overpowering fright. Uh, officer, somebody. Yes, General. The prisoner, he's to be taken out at once and he's to be shot. Uh, the General's mind is wandering. The General's mind is not wandering. Those were my written orders and they are still my orders. March the prisoner away from here. Line up a firing squad and execute him. Well, did you hear me? Execute this spy at once. Detail. 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 Ready? Your order has been carried out. The prisoner Parker Addison is dead. How silent everything is. How very silent. Is there anything else, sir? Make sure the prisoner's body is taken to his home and placed in the family's burying ground. Where would that be, sir? The prisoner has no identification. His home is quite near here. But he was from the north, a Yankee. No, he was not. You knew the prisoner, sir? The man you have just shot to death was Parker Addison, my son, my only son. And my body is to be placed next to his. Of course, General Addison. Of course. Thank you, Captain. I feel so calm. No suffering. No pain. Maybe this is what Parker meant by death. The Civil War finally ended, having reaped what it thought was the harvest of perpetual peace by this one bloody trial of sharp war. The nation tended its wounds and did its best to soften the agony and torment of four long years, years of a war that often pitted brother against brother or, as in this case, father against son. I shall be back shortly. Ambrose Bierce, the author of the short story on which this dramatization was based, has been praised for being among the few American writers of the past hundred years with the uncanny ability to reveal man as a proud but helpless figure in the clutch of a ruthless destiny. Our cast included Christopher Tabori, Arnold Moss, E.V. Juster, Earl Hammond, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.